Situated on the ancient trade routes from the Atlantic Ocean, Ireland has seen thousands of vessels wrecked on her coast. For centuries, Dublin has been a busy trading port. Its approaches have proved to be extremely hazardous for shipping and became a graveyard for thousands of vessels. Not a merchant vessel, but there to protect the trade, the loss of the battleship HMS Vanguard was but one of them. Saturday morning in early May. Members of the Marlin Diving Club kit up and prepare for the journey out into Dublin Bay. Philip Oglesby has been with the club for 17 years. The Marlin Club was founded in 1981 and I joined myself in 1983. And by the, by the end of the season of 83, which is August, I was a qualified diver. <coughs> I was always interested in, in diving. Uh, for, for a long time before I took up diving, I was very interested in watching television programs and so on. Philip is the lead diver on this outing. Seven divers will travel today. He has an interest in the numerous shipwrecks spotted around the entrance to the bay. 1986, the Marlins Tobacco Club did a project on a wreck called the Queen Victoria in Houth. And that was my first experience of any sort of amateur underwater archaeology. And I found it absolutely fascinating. Over the winter, the club have been researching another wreck in the bay. Today is their first recce dive on the remains of the HMS Vanguard, which they hope to survey over the coming summer. The club is equipped with a powerful boat, and it's fitted out for long-range diving. The Vanguard is situated 14 and a half miles to the southeast of Dunleary and this journey takes approximately 45 minutes. The principal reason for selecting the Vanguard was due to the fact that the diving community had a unique shipwreck on its doorstep, which was hardly dived on at all, and about whose overall condition there was relatively little known. Roy Stokes has been studying the history of the wreck. In the mid-1860s, we were creating a new breed of warships and they opened a competition inviting uh, designs for a new battleship, a medium class battleship. A man called Edward Reed, who was a, a notable naval, naval architect of, of the period, won this competition and designed for the British Admiralty four very special battleships of the medium class these were later known as an audacious class. The Vanguard, which is one of them, was um, built in the famous yards of Laird at Birkenhead. Today the weather is perfect. There's little swell over the wreck and plenty of sunlight. The team have already attached boys to the bow, stern and midships of the vessel. On this dive, they will secure their boat to the midsection of the wreck and prepare to make the 48 meter dive. Okay lads, buddy check. Okay. Weights on. Weights on. Air on. Air on. Okay. On the dive, a dive program, briefings are very important because everyone needs to know what everyone else is doing. The divers need to know before they go in the water exactly what the task is and how long they have to do it. Because we didn't have underwater communications, it's very important that we stick to our time schedules. The people on the board on board also need to know what time we're going to return at. Two together on my signal, ready, clear. The cameraman for the project is the well-known diver John Pear, who explains how he became interested in underwater filming. 
I got interested in underwater photography because I found it very difficult to explain to other people uh, what it was like in this other world that I was seeing. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, I decided to take up photography, really, I suppose, to uh, paint a picture of what was happening and to bring back this new world that I was seeing and found it very difficult to explain. The task chosen on today's dive is to examine some of the condition of the deck's main fittings. These brass and bronze pieces have hardly corroded at all and are in remarkable condition. Moving along, the divers record the size of the main anchor. The difficulties of filming the wreck are explained by John Pear. The, the biggest problem that photography presents is your buoyancy, trying to keep yourself buoyant. Uh, and by buoyancy, I mean not to be touching the subject or the ground or the surrounding areas uh, that uh, you're trying to photograph. The capstan, which was used to haul the main anchor. Almost titanic looking, the bow was shrouded in old nets. And a rigging eye used to secure the towering mast. My first dive to the Vanguard was really a test run to see what conditions were really like. I, I, I was amazed, first of all, with the darkness. So one of the big problems was lighting, and we had to make sure that the lighting that we had was effective enough in order to illuminate the subjects that we were trying to photograph. With some promising preliminary results, the dive team returns to Dunleary for further research, and from where they will make their plans for the next dive to the wreck. Portsmouth, England, and the dive team obtain a unique insight to an ironclad battleship from the period, HMS Warrior. HMS Warrior, which accompanied the Vanguard on the day she sank, has been professionally restored and is now open to the public as a museum and hospitality ship. Some of the warrior's armaments have been superbly replicated, down to sidearms, which were stowed over the crew's heads. The muskets and cutlasses were intended for use by the crew when repelling or boarding an enemy vessel, and for shore engagement by marines. Measuring well over six feet in diameter, the warrior's main wheel assembly is similar to the one visible on the wreck of the Vanguard. Under certain conditions, it would require several strong men to steer these huge ships. Boilers, fueled with tons of coal by sweating stokers, could turn the Vanguard's unique twin mangan screw propellers, giving her a maximum speed of about ten knots. Accommodation and places of confinement for sailors were basic and contrasted with the relatively lavish conditions of some of the ship's principal officers. As the team make their way back to Ireland, they reflect on the remarkable insight they have acquired from the loving restoration of an old ironclad battleship. In 1875, national unrest was beginning to worry Irish MPs, who had become concerned with the lack of sufficient naval presence around the Irish coast. The Admiralty responded by assembling a fleet of battleships to sail the colours around Ireland and to make calls on several ports. On the last leg of the cruise, they set sail from Belfast to Kingstown. Now, Dunleary. Towards the end of August, the Admiral, Admiral Tarleton, decided that um, a visit to Queenstown was a The Admiral, Admiral Tarleton, 
decided that um, a visit to Queenstown was required. They had missed Queenstown uh, on their way around Ireland and um, through various petitions they were asked to visit Queenstown. So he then decided that um, four ships to the line would set out on September 1st uh, to visit Queenstown. The entry in the log of the HMS Vanguard, one of the four battleships to sail for Queenstown, for the period September 1st, 1875, begins with Dublin Bay. It was to be the final entry in the log of the great battleship, as she never returned to port. Now at 10 o'clock on September 1st, they set off from Kingstown uh, in a line. Um, at about midday, they uh, rounded to Kishbank and headed south. At this point, hazy conditions were giving away to fog. The captain of the vanguard, Richard Dawkins, had already handed over the bridge to his officers and gone below. It was midday and time to relieve the ship from some of the burden of carrying so much fine wine and food. Unbeknownst to Dawkins, Captain Hinckley and the Iron Duke had been overcome with a similar desire. The four ships were making good progress, steaming at over eight knots. They would soon begin a manoeuvre, bringing the vanguard and Duke abreast of the Hector and HMS Warrior, but the fog was to get worse. The Admiral then gave the order for the Earl Duke and um, Vanguard to come up abreast himself and Hector. HMS Warrior and Hector went out of view of the Vanguard, um, which was then completing the manoeuvre with Earl Duke. Suddenly, out of the fog, a sailing ship emerged and crossed the path of the Vanguard. She veered sharply to port in order to avoid collision. Her port beam was now exposed to the oncoming Iron Duke. Despite frantic efforts by both vessels, alas, they were all too late. The Iron Duke ploughed into the Vanguard about midships on her port side. For an hour and ten minutes, the crew struggled with the pumps against the massive rent in the side of the ship. The great engines came to a halt and the steaming boilers were vented off. Those aboard the Duke could only assist the doomed vessel by helping to rescue her crew before she gave a final lurch and plunged 20 fathoms to the seabed. The papers of the day were to report that the first reserve guardship of the Eastern Irish District, HMS Vanguard, based at Kingstown, was lost at sea. All hands were saved. But questions were to remain. How could such a fine modern battleship be lost so easily? The most immediate question, however, was could the Vanguard be saved? The team of salvers were sent from uh, Devonport, Devonport under Commander Bath. Now, they had very little um, success in um, salving um, any of the heavy guns from the ship, they cleared it, made it safe for shipping, and despite uh, attempts to raise it, these all failed. And nothing more was done, but there is some evidence that uh, they returned the following year to clear even more um, fittings and debris from the deck of the wreck. Once more, Marlin sets out from Dunleary. Their training would stand to them as the survey progressed. Well, there is a fair bit of training involved. Because of the depth and the decompression required, uh, we insisted that the whole team, and we had a team of 20, be trained up to extended range diver certification. What's your run time? 48 minutes. Okay. okay, ready to dive? Ready to dive? Okay, clear. Going to a depth of 50 metres, the divers first take a brief look at the ship's main capstan. Later, they enter the wreck and penetrate to the ship's gun room on the main deck. Thank you. 
This is where they hope to glimpse a first sight of the ship's great wheel. It's in a remarkable and surprising state of preservation. Having separated into two groups, one of these moves to measure the less well-preserved main wheel assembly situated on the upper deck. Divers measuring the inside wheel now move outside to see the remains of the foremast, which is 28 meters below surface water. They conclude their dive by moving along the port side of the battleship, where the stills photographer hoped to get some shots. But before the divers return to the surface, they must remain some time longer in order to decompress. Decompression stops are mandatory stops to allow uh, out cask of nitrogen. And this reduces the risk of decompression sickness, commonly known as a bend or the bends. Arriving back on the surface, the divers are picked up by the boat with their final survey dive for the season completed, they return once more successfully to their base in Dunleary. Success, however, was not to follow Captain Dawkins. At a court case of his peers, he was to receive what was described at the time as rough justice. The court martial was convened in Denport aboard HMS um, Adelaide and um, the affair was a very embarrassing one. Uh, the loss of HMS Varangard, a relatively new ship uh, built in um, 1870 was an embarrassing one. The loss uh, half a million, half a million pounds at the time <coughs> and um, Several people had to had to be blamed. Um, several officers lost their lost their their their, um, their commissions. Captain Dawkins was severely reprimanded and uh, lost his command. The court case and and um, the sentences that were handed down to the officers, the carpenter Toidy and Captain Dawkins were very unpopular, and this seemed to be uh, so unpopular that um, a ditty and a song was was got out. Um, about the occasion and, and there is much criticism about the Admiralty uh, and the last verse probably sums up the opinion and these, the, 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 this song is apparently supposed to have been sung in music halls at the time. We are to have men up there in White Hall who know about life on the sea and a clear those frauds who call themselves lords and ever the admiralty. 